I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend part of your Mother's Day weekend with us, either in person or online. Thank you so much for joining us. I realize that if you don't live in the United States, it's not Mother's Day. But for those of us here in the States, Mother's Day can be a bit of a complicated holiday. It just holds this wide range of emotions from total exhilaration to great sorrow. On the surface, it seems like it's this holiday made for Hallmark cards and Kodak moments. But underneath the flowers and the sentimental cards, there can be some tough realities. And I resonate with the complicated emotions that you might be feeling today. I am the mother of three incredible children, one who lives near me, one who lives a thousand miles away, and one who passed away eight years ago and is in heaven. So like many of you, I hold both joy and sorrow today, and that's okay. I weep with those who weep, and I rejoice with those who rejoice. As I thought about what to say on Mother's Day, I reflected on the last two messages we've heard. Two weeks ago, when we began a new sermon series, Building a Better Future, Pastor Tom Holliday talked from chapter one of Nehemiah and encouraged us to take stock of where we are, to not be afraid to intentionally let ourselves grieve and mourn what has been lost or changed in the last year, or perhaps even to fast, either from food or technology, and to increase our time in prayer, to concentrate on hearing God speak to us. And then last week, Pastor Buddy asked us to take a further look at our inner life and how it's been affected by the challenges of the last year by giving us a word on rebuilding the city of your soul. The reason these words about the soul are so important is because the world is split into doers and beers. Those who are natural, their natural inclination is toward doing. They see a problem or a challenge or an opportunity, and they immediately launch into action. Move, go, fix. Others of us lean toward contemplation, thinking carefully and thoughtfully before we act, and we tend to focus more on who we are than on what we do. Well, the truth is, it takes both kinds of people to make our world healthy and balanced. But before we launch into the doing part of building a better future, I believe it's helpful to make sure that we are as strong on the inside as we are on the outside. So let's get started. If we could have a conversation and tease out what it is that you want from your time here on earth, what is it that sits in the center place? What is it that drives you? What is it that you're going after? There are a couple of powerful core desires that we all share. To love and be loved is probably the number one core desire. Another is the desire to belong, to feel like we fit in. And for most of us, there is also a great consuming desire to know that our time here on earth has meant something, that we haven't just taken up space, breathed air, and then died without leaving something valuable behind us. We all want to be remembered. We want to feel like we mattered and we had significance. We want to leave a legacy. I think somewhere inside nearly every human being is the desire to be the goat, to be the greatest of all time in something. Some chase being the greatest of all time with a vengeance. From an early age, they decide they are going to be the best at, and you fill in the blank, they're gonna be the best in the financial world. They are gonna be the best in the sports world. They are gonna be the best in movies and television, entertainment, in music, in writing. Some people decide that they're going to be the greatest of all time in academics, some in politics, some in technology or IT. I mean, there are so many ways to try and be the greatest. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with having big goals. I mean, we wouldn't have gone to the moon or have cell phones or have my favorite hamburger in an outburger unless somebody had gigantic goals. But there are at least two cautionary realities that we need to be aware of. The first is the vast majority of us simply don't get to be the greatest of all time. So few will reach the pinnacles of human achievement. There are relatively few billionaires or athletes who set unbreakable records. 
Only 46 people have become the president of the United States. And there aren't many who will start something like Microsoft or Apple or Google. There aren't many that will build iconic buildings or own a chain of restaurants that go global like Starbucks and KFC. That degree of achievement doesn't happen to very many of us. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but you just need to keep in mind that the odds are stacked against you. The second reality is so few people have big goals when it comes to achievements that can't be quantified by numbers, sales, or awards. We like the goals that can be measured and recognized, but few shoot for the stars and desire to be the greatest of all time when it comes to their inner life. Few people aim at greatness in the soul. And yet it is the soul that is eternal. All the other big goals are temporary. Eventually, somebody will build a bigger, taller building, topple your speed or endurance record, expand their restaurant chain in more states or countries than yours, make a better burger, discover something more useful to humanity than what you discovered. In other words, as I heard someone say one time, eventually, all of your trophies will end up in the trash can. They just don't last. But growing a great soul, however, is an effort that will have an impact for eternity because the soul is eternal. On top of that, there are no limits to how great and deep your soul can become. There is no ceiling, glass or otherwise. You and I can never reach the place where we can say, my soul is as deep and wide as it could possibly be. No more growth is even possible. And probably the most important of all, growing a deep and great soul is within the reach of every person. There is not a person alive who cannot grow a great soul. Gender doesn't matter. Where you came from doesn't matter. Your ethnic background doesn't matter, where you grew up, whether you came from money or whether you came from the gutter or any place in between. All of us have the same capacity to grow a deep, great soul. 3 John 1 verse 2 says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. The Apostle John says that we need to have healthy souls. He prays for the health of his friend's soul. Many versions say, I pray that your body will prosper as your soul is prospering. Well, what does a deep, healthy soul look like? There are entire books, libraries probably written on this subject, but one that I highly recommend is Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. But let's just look briefly at a couple of soul health indicators and then focus on the process of growing a great soul, a great soul. In Mark 9, 35, Jesus sat them down and he called them around him and he said, anyone wanting to be the greatest must be the least, the servant of all. Mark 12, 30 to 31, again, Jesus says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the Apostle Paul says, And now these three remain faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The Bible narrows all of our earthly pursuits of greatness to this singular focus, love. Love God with your heart. Love God with your soul. Love God with your mind. Love God with all your strength. Love God with every fiber of your being. And love your neighbor with the same passion and energy and devotion as you love yourself. The greatest thing in life is love. Jesus says, 
every one of us can reach the pinnacle of greatness by loving God with all of who we are and by loving our fellow human beings with the tenderness with which we love ourselves. This is, to me, the greatest legacy that any of us can leave. To know at the end of our time here on earth that what people remember most about us is not what we accomplished, which is temporary at best, and we will be surpassed by somebody else in another generation. Maybe the very best thing that any of us can leave behind us is this. She loved the Lord her God with all her heart, with all of her soul, and with all of her mind. He loved the Lord his God with everything he had, with every ounce of strength he had. He loved God. And she loved the people God brought into her path, genuinely, sacrificially, and wholeheartedly. Well, how do we get to that place? How do we develop this great soul? How do we learn to love in such a way that it, characterizes our lives? How do we become great in the kingdom of God? I have been a Christ follower since I was eight years old, and I've learned that this kind of growth is a process in which God and I each have a part. So I want to look at four specific ways that you and I can grow a great soul. The starting point in growing a great soul is responding to God's invitation to each of us to begin a relationship with him. God's part is he invites, and my part, I respond. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 4, that God chose us first. It says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Entire books have been written on the spiritual wealth in this verse, and we can't go too far into it right now. But the takeaway for you is that before God made anything, before he made the sun and the moon or the stars, before he made the oceans and the, the myriad animals that populated earth, insects and birds and plants, before it all, his mind was on us and how he could bring us into relationship with him. We were not an afterthought to God. The very first thought he had about us was how to establish a relationship, how to bring us to himself. And so God did the prep work. He made a beautiful world that reveals there is a creator, creating curiosity in us to know this creator. And then he issues an invitation to get to know him. There is an emptiness, a vacancy in our hearts that was meant to be filled by God and by God alone. And we so easily fill that vacancy with big goals and even lesser things like TV and movies and a career and education and food and sex and recreation. I mean, an endless list of ways to fill the vacancy inside of us. But our part, our part to God's invitation is to respond to him. Romans 10, 9 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you haven't responded yet to God's invitation to you to come close and know him and start a relationship, don't wait. Do it today. Don't wait any longer. Come to Jesus. If you haven't started a relationship with Jesus, I'll lead us in a prayer at the end of this message where you can pray to start one. So, once we've responded to God's invitation to us and taken the first step, then what happens? Well, a process begins, this back and forth between me and God, this ebb and flow. He creates, we're curious. He invites, we respond. The next is God's part is he transforms me and my part, I surrender to him. When I give my life to God, he begins to transform me, not into a better me, but into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And he gives me the power to change, to develop the fruit of the spirit, what the Bible calls the fruit of the spirit, these characteristics that the Holy Spirit develops in us once Jesus is living inside of us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. 
we gradually become a different person than we were when we first encountered him. You've probably heard Rick say often that God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. And I think many of you could tell the story of your life and how different you are today. The old habits that have slipped away, new habits that have begun. In fact, some of you would say, I don't even recognize the person I used to be. Thank God. His power at work in us gives us what we need to live this way. 2 Peter 1.3 says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And my part in that transformation process is to surrender to him completely. Not only when he asks something simple of me, but in all things. Romans 12.1, I ask you, the Apostle Paul says, from my heart to give your bodies to God because of his loving kindness to us. Let your bodies be a living and holy gift given to God. He is pleased with this kind of gift. This is the true worship that you should give him. In all things, I am his. He is my owner, my master, my Lord. I belong to him and my life is his. It's as though God is a master potter and his, his hands are lovingly shaping and forming me on his pottery wheel. The Bible mentions in several places this imagery and even makes fun of a pot that has the audacity to tell the master potter that he doesn't know what he's doing. Listen, we are the clay on his wheel and he knows what he's doing. And our part is to say to stay soft and yielded to him as he makes and remakes us into the vision he has always had of who he wants us to be like, his son, Jesus. And then another aspect of this give and take, this God's part and my part, is God teaches and my part is to learn. When Jesus was here on the earth, he spent three years in a very close, intimate relationship with his 12 disciples. They went everywhere together. They traveled together, they ate together, the disciples were present at his miracles. They were in boats with them. They were in the synagogue day in and day out. They were together all the time doing the normal activities of daily life. They brought him their questions, their doubts, their confusion, their frustration. And he had answers and wisdom and guidance for them. And they came to depend on him and his wisdom for making decisions. But then they saw him arrested and crucified on a cross and then after that, they saw him in his resurrection body. And then they saw him return to heaven. Jesus knew that before he went, that he was going to be going back to his father. And he began to tell them that he wasn't going to be visible to them any longer. And they got really anxious about him leaving. They were fearful that they wouldn't know what to do, that they wouldn't have the right answers for living. In the book of John, he tells his disciples that, Although he won't physically be with them any longer, he will send the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to live inside of them. And the Holy Spirit would continue his, Jesus's, teaching. John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. In another passage, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So Jesus tells his disciples that his spirit would actually live inside of them and the spirit would remind them of all the incredible wisdom and knowledge that Jesus had taught them. So fast forward to me, to you. How does it work for us? We didn't get to walk with Jesus here on earth. We didn't get to learn from him in person the way that they did. And we have a lot of questions. I don't know about you, but I often find myself unsure, unsure of what to feel, how to act, what to think, what to do next. You know, we ask these questions, who should I marry? When should I have kids? Should I move? Should I change locations? Should I switch jobs? What friends should I choose? There are just countless decisions to make in a lifetime. And we can either depend on ourselves for wisdom, other frail and flawed human beings, popular culture, the current accepted conventional wisdom, or we can turn to God 
who knows all there is to know about anything and everything. He has given us his spirit, the spirit of truth, and he will teach you. So if God's part is to teach me what I need to know, my part is to learn. It sounds really simple and straightforward, but it can take practice to get it right. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14 says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Writer of Hebrews is pretty blunt. I mean, he's actually a bit appalled that some of his readers haven't grown very much. They're still spiritual babies who can only digest spiritual milk. He basically says, you are sucking on a bottle when you should be chewing on steak. He tells them that they should be able to understand more complex spiritual matters, doctrine and principles that require chewing because they've been followers of Christ for a long time. And he says, I just keep having to talk to you about the most simple things of God because you have not grown. You have not learned. Paul says the way to move from being a spiritual baby who just needs a bottle to a mature believer who can handle the word of God and understands how life works, it's by constant use of God's word, becoming proficient in the truths and principles and doctrines in the word, training yourself to distinguish good from evil. That's actually very hopeful to me. It's hopeful because it means that every one of us can mature as a believer. It's not just for a few lucky few who figure out the secret code or the secret handshake. No, the truth is anyone can put in the effort, the practice, and the repetition to learn how to distinguish good from evil. This is how we learn anything. It's how we get proficient at any skill, whether it's standing on the free throw line on the basketball court and shooting baskets hour after hour, day after day, or practicing the scales on the piano for months or years until you don't have to look at your hands anymore because they know where every note is. Repetition, constant use, practice. You practice till you get it right. This is our part, to read and study the Word of God and to put it into practice, to be obedient to it over and over and over again until it almost becomes second nature to us. God will teach us. He has provided for us. Our part is to choose to put in the time to learn and become proficient. The last aspect of God's part in my growing a deep soul, what we're looking at today, is that he brings good out of evil. And my part is to endure hardship. Romans 8, 28 says, we are well aware that God works with those who love him, those who have been called in accordance with his purpose and turns everything to their good. This is probably one of the most misunderstood or misapplied verses in the Bible. It's often said by well-meaning folks to people in grief or loss as sort of this magic eraser verse to try to minimize or contain the amount of hurt and sadness or sorrow we feel. There were many people who said this verse to me after the death of our 27-year-old son as though simply knowing that God could bring good out of tragedy would keep our hearts from breaking. It didn't. It didn't make our pain go away. And for any of you who've had that verse used on you as a way to try to make you stop hurting and feeling sad, I'm sorry. God is not trying to make you stop hurting in this verse. He is gently asking you to hold on while he continues his work in our broken world. 
He is asking you to endure, not to stop hurting. One of my favorite quotes is from Eric Little, who was an Olympian in the 1924 Olympics. And he said, circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. You may have faced horrific evil circumstances, leaving you certain that your life is wrecked and ruined. But I want to reassure you, God is not helpless in your ruins. As we cooperate with God's plan to grow a deep soul within us, we can be certain, certain that he is not beaten by evil and that he has unexpected ways of turning evil circumstances into something that contains beauty. I'll tell you honestly, I can't always see it immediately. My eyes can't always seem to find the beauty from the ashes of our tragedy. But I believe he can, and he will, and he is, and someday, in some way, I will see it. And when I believe that, when I believe that, I can persevere. I can wait with hope. I can endure. Colossians 1.11 says, We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul, not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It's strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Many of you could bear witness to the ways that you have and are today enduring the unendurable, the thing you said you could never endure, and yet here you are. Sometimes endurance looks like the grim strength of just toughing it out. But sometimes, over time, it moves to a place of enduring in the glory strength that God gives. And sometimes, even spills over into joy. Not, not necessarily giddiness, but rock solid joy. Let me close with a passage from Jeremiah that speaks of what happens when our focus shifts from growing spiritually, when we wander from God, and what happens when we focus on growing a great soul. Jeremiah 17, five to eight, the Lord says, I will put a curse on people who trust in mere human beings, who depend on mere flesh and blood for their strength, and whose hearts have turned away from the Lord. They will be like a shrub in the arid rift valley. They will not experience good things even when they happen. It will be as though they were growing in the stony wastes in the wilderness, in a salt land where no one can live. The Bible says there, when we stop depending on God, when we stop building and deepening our soul, when we decide that we're going to put our trust and our energy and our passion and our dependence in ourselves or in other people, that we will end up like, like a, a tumbleweed, a, a bush that has completely dried up, has no more roots, and it's just rolling across the desert landscape. We will be as empty and hopeless and aimless as that tumbleweed. So the result in your life, if you stop pursuing, growing a great soul, is emptiness and hopelessness and aimless wandering. But what happens if we decide that we're gonna keep focusing? What happens when I focus on growing a great soul? The rest of that passage says this, my blessing, God says, is on those people who trust in me, who put their confidence in me. They will be like a tree planted near a stream whose roots spread out toward the water. This tree has nothing to fear when the heat comes. Its leaves 
are always green. It has no need to be concerned in a year of drought. It does not stop bearing fruit. When we decide to keep growing a great soul, the result is fruitfulness in every season, whether it's rain, no rain, whether there's flood, whether there's years of drought. The Bible says when our roots are planted deep into God, there's humility. There's fruitfulness in every season. He said, instead of being this tumbleweed that's rootless and blown around at the whim of every rogue wind, we can be like majestic trees that line the riverbeds, that flourish, and they're laden with fruit, delicious fruit in every season, even those seasons of extreme heat and long months or years of drought. And this delicious fruit, this fruit, this fruitfulness that Jeremiah is talking about, I think is this deep soul. It's a great soul where the character of Christ is reproduced in us by that process of planting and responding, of seeking and finding, of teaching and learning, of him working through the bad times and us enduring the unendurable and of us sending our spiritual roots deep into him. And this fruit will be a lasting legacy of a man or a woman who loved God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind and all their strength and who loved their neighbor as themselves. One last promise to you, as you dare to grow a deep soul, a great soul, God will finish what he has started in you. Philippians 1.6, the Apostle Paul says, And I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. So let's just go back briefly to, to where we started. You may have some big dreams for your life. You've got some of that greatest of all time pursuit on your mind. Why not redirect some of that passion toward building a legacy that can't be outdone by anyone else? A legacy that has no limits on how far it expands. A legacy of loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Love is the greatest legacy you can leave. Some of you may have realized, or maybe you've known for some time, that you haven't ever really begun this journey. And today is your moment to say yes to God's invitation to get to know him through Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand it all. A simple prayer is all. In fact, if you'd like to just bow your head for just a moment, you don't have to say this out loud, but you can just say this in your mind. God, I want to be a part of you. I don't really know what all that means, but please forgive me for living my life apart from you. I don't want to be like one of those tumbleweeds that's aimless and wandering because I've tried to trust everybody and everything but you. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life and to be my savior. If you will dare to pray that, God will begin that ongoing process of inviting, you responding, him transforming you, you surrendering, him teaching, you learning, him bringing good out of evil, and you using his strength to endure. And fruit will be grown in your soul, fruit for yourself and enough to give away to others. Will you believe that he will finish what he has started? Will you decide to leave the greatest legacy of all? Will you decide that your greatest accomplishment, your greatest legacy will be this? She loved God with all her heart, her soul, and her mind, and her strength. He loved people like he loved himself. Let me pray for us. God, you've heard us as we have, you've heard our souls calling to you. You hear us, you hear the cries of our heart. You hear the things that we don't know how to articulate to other people. You know the things that are just sort of heaped up inside of us, the things that 
are difficult to actually put into words. But God, I know there are people listening to this today who have realized maybe for the very first time that their goals have been okay, but they're only temporary. And there's some here today who are coming for the very first time and asking you, God, to be their God, Jesus, for you to be their Savior. And I ask for them as they start this journey that you will be faithful to do in them what you have said you would do, that you would do this process of teaching them, of training them, that you would give them strength to endure, that you would transform them, that you would change them, and that you would finish the work in us that you said you would do. And God, for those who maybe have known you for a long time, but have grown tired on the inside, the circumstances of this last year in particular have just been brutal. They've been so hard and their souls are weary. They're tired. They don't have much energy or passion. And to think about being the greatest of anything is really too much to think about right now. So God, for those who are just kind of hanging on today, May they feel revived to know that they don't have to be anything special. They don't have to have these great accomplishments. They don't have to have been born in a certain place or from certain people or have had a certain background or certain education. None of that matters. Really, just as they come into your presence, they have the ability and the capability because of what you've done in us to grow a great soul. God, I pray that our church will be filled with people who have great souls people who've done the work of being in your presence, of learning by putting into practice day in and day out what your word says, and that you would transform us into people who we're known, God, for loving you with all we have, and we're known for loving each other deeply, dearly, greatly from the heart. I pray a blessing on my friends and my brothers and my sisters. In the name of Jesus, amen. See you next week.